thank you all so much for being here. Thank you, the Instituto Cervantes, for having us, and Maria for, for introducing us. It's wonderful. You're all here. Thanks for making it uh, on a Tuesday night. I really appreciate it. Can you hear me? OK, good. So I'm going to read from the prologue of the book to start out, and then Stephanie and I will have a conversation, and then we'll open it up to questions at the end. All right? So I'm going to read... Um, not from the very beginning, because the book opens with the assassination of Garcia Lorca. Uh, so I'm going to start right after that, but that, just to explain why I talk about Lorca here at the beginning. This, this book is not about Federico Garcia Lorca or solely about the Spanish Civil War. It is, however, about two facets of human experience inseparable from his death and the war, the braiding of lives and stories and the interplay between memory and myth. There are many books about Lorca, and nearly all of them mention the fact that the moon wasn't visible on the night he was killed. I mention this, too, in my account of his death, twice to be exact. The moon appeared frequently in Lorca's poetry, perhaps most iconically in romance, De la Luna, la Luna, or Ballad of the Moon, Moon, which includes the line so heart-rending in retrospect, Uye Luna, 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 flee, moon, moon, moon. The people who write about Lorca's death highlight the moon's absence because of the poetic irony and tragic aura. A man who constantly called out to the moon for inspiration wouldn't have been able to seek its comfort during his last moments on Earth as he looked up at the sky, knowing that he was about to die. I understand why biographers underline Lorca's abandonment by the moon. It is gorgeously terrible. Yet, objectively, it means absolutely nothing. The moon's absence was incidental, random, trivia that only takes on the meaning we give it. It allows us to add a small dab of beauty, however painful, onto a story that is at heart nothing more than proof of human barbarity. We can't control history, our evocations of Lorca's final minutes seem to say, but we can control the stories we tell about history. It's true, converting experience into narrative gives an illusion of control, and sometimes even actual control. This is the ultimate tragedy of Lorca that he lost not just his life, but his words, his role as a teller of his story. His death was his end as a narrator. The question then is, if we can't control our lives, can we ever hope to control our stories? The story I tell in this book is about five flawed individuals at the mercy of historical forces who, nevertheless, relentlessly, even self-destructively, answered this question in the affirmative. Their lives were shaped by the Spanish Civil War and its legacy, yet they insisted on exercising their narrative rights as if their words might rewrite reality, even at their own peril. In doing so, they shaped eras which at the, at the same time shaped them, transforming personal history into national myth. The century-long saga I tell is about a family that turned the stories about their lives into their lives. Perhaps fittingly, I didn't go looking for it. The story pulled me in like a force beyond my control. Nearly 76 years after Lodka's death, in the summer of 2012, I was living in Madrid, where the Spanish Civil War was now a collective memory, albeit still a very touchy one. Four years earlier, when I was 26, I had met a Spanish woman named Elisa while visiting Guatemala. When we tell the story today, our own neatly packaged narrative hewn from memory, it comes off as obnoxiously picturesque. She was volunteering at an orphanage where I had volunteered the year before. When I came back to see the children that summer, there she was, and there I was. We spent eight days together over the next six weeks as I traveled around Guatemala doing research for an article, and she taught kindergarten. That was all it took. Three years later, we got married in an Andalusian patio full of orange trees, surrounded by Spaniards and Americans, everyone eating from the same humongous paella with our names written in red peppers. He ate from that paella. <laughs> I liked living in Spain. Before moving to Madrid, we spent two years in Elisa's hometown of Cordoba in the south. There I lucked into a group of friends that made the small provincial city with its labyrinthine alleys feel like home. During the work week, I mixed freelance assignments with a novel I hoped to finish. On the weekends, Elisa and I got together with her family or our friends from the, for the heavy midday meal, followed by the part of eating in Spain that I found nearly as delicious as the food, la sobremesa, the period after eating when you sit and drink coffee and talk for, for as long as the conversation lasts, sometimes even until you're hungry again. <laughs> 
I really didn't have much figured out besides my love for literature and Elisa, but that was enough. Life in Spain was good. In other respects, life in Spain wasn't so good. The financial crisis had left the country in free fall. Unemployment nationally was at nearly 30%, and it was much higher in Cordoba. After the nonprofit where Elisa worked ran out of money, she spent nine months unemployed. When we finally, we, we finally left Cordoba for Madrid where she found a job. Amidst all of this, as Elisa and I were starting to seriously consider leaving Spain, one night in June 2012, my friend Javi invited us over to watch a movie. Javi is that friend I always seem to seek out wherever I am who ups my degree of cool by association. The difference this time around was that Javi's studied hipness had a European flavor. He smoked cigarettes with gestures that alluded to scenes from French New Wave films, cruised around on a Royal Enfield motorcycle, and read worrisome quantities of Goethe. I'd met him playing basketball in Cordoba, and now we'd ended up living a short walk away from each other in Madrid. As it turned out, Javi's invitation would be a big bang of sorts in my life, a day that unsuspectingly proliferated into thousands of other days, leading me back in time and deep into lives distinct from my own, but which nonetheless seemed to speak to me directly. Javi set up the projector in his living room and explained that we were going to watch a Spanish cult documentary from the 1970s called El Desencanto. I tried translating in my head. The unhappiness? No, I thought. Too stilted. The disenchantment? Maybe. I would, ha I would just have to see. Javi didn't want to say much about the film, only that it was about a dead Spanish poet and his strange family. Lo vas a flipar, Javi said, hitting play. You're going to love it. The opening credits rolled over an old-timey black-and-white family photo, a mother posing in a shadowy sitting room with three young, adorable boys. No one in the photo looked happy in the least. This was the beginning, the moment I met the Paneros. The person missing from the photo was the father and husband, Leopoldo Panero, a man people often refer to as the Poeta Oficial, or Poet Laureate of the Franco dictatorship. The premise of El Desencanto is disarmingly simple. Mother and sons convene in 1974, 20 years after that photo was taken, to talk about dad, who died 12 years earlier in 1962. As is the case with every family, but especially this one, things in fact aren't simple at all. Leopoldo Panero left behind an embittered, seductively eloquent widow, Felicidad Blanc, who has her own version of the family story to tell. The same goes for her three brilliant and troubled sons, who compete for the title of pa Panero Poetic Heir. Juan Luis the Eldest is a hard-drinking dandy who puts on the airs of a re reincarnated F. Scott Fitzgerald with a bullfighter's swagger. Leopoldo Maria, the middle son, has been in and out of mental institutions, a doomed genius in the tradition of the French poet Antonin Artaud. Michi, the youngest, is the handsome guide to the Panero universe and its subtle pyrotechnician, lighting the fuse to the family's powder keg of rivalries and resentments which blow up on camera. Lingering in the background of their story is the pall of the dictatorship, like an illness they've learned to live with. As they throw up in the closet where all the dirty laundry has been moldering for decades, the film turns into a communal hatchet job on the memory of Leopoldo Panero, as well as a deconstruction of that most universal and inescapable, inescapable of human institutions, family. Two things elevate El Desencanto from being a uniquely bizarre on-screen therapy session into a more powerful and lasting artifact. One, the viewer understands that the family is a microcosm of the society that produced it, and what's wrong in one is connected what, to what's wrong in the other. Family is the primal seat of memory, making private myths out of experience that are inseparable from public myths. The Paneros can be seen as a metaphor for Spain and its past. Two, the Paneros are collectively Don Quixote. While the great disheveled knight errant of Spanish literature is most famous for tilting at windmills, the reason he did so wasn't because he was a born man of action. It was because he had ingested too many books and taken them literally. His fantasy filled with everything he had read, wrote Cervantes of his tragicomic hero. Enchantments as well as combats, battles, challenges, wounds, courtings, loves, torments, and other impossible foolishness. This overdose of narrative is what spurred Don Quixote to go on his epic adventures. The Paneros, too, have saturated their mind with books, and the manner in which they talk and act comes off nearly as headlong as the night from La Mancha. They seem to believe that their collective past, combined with their present lives, is a novel they're in the midst of writing. It becomes clear that the family doesn't know how not to frame its existence inside of literature. Storytelling is their vice.
I recalled the famous opening line of Anna Karenina, which I would soon learn had already been applied to the Banedos ad nauseum. All happy families are alike. Each unhappy family is unhappy in its own way. In El Desencanto, the Banedos up the ante, their shared talent, and infuse their in its own wayness with a prophecy. We learn that none of the sons appears to be able to bear children, so they may have meet, reached El Fin de Raza, the end of the, lo- the bloodline. The film, then, is a kind of theatrical last will and testament, which explains why the fa- stakes feel so high. They revel in this atmosphere of refined fatalism, casting themselves as characters in a Wagnerian opera. Of course, the Paneros uh, are just people, like you and me, no matter how poetic or odd. But it is as if they refuse to accept this banal fact, as though simply being one more family buffeted by history and chance without the gilding of literary myth would be unbearable. They opt instead to invest their story with the mystique that only art can provide. In doing so, they construct a new legacy. Yes, I thought when the film was over, the disenchantment. That's the right translation, because the title was both the truth and a lie. Yes, life in Franco's Spain seemed to have robbed them of an essential wholeness, but the Banedos delighted in their dissolution, willfully converting it into literature to enchant the viewer. The documentary I had just seen was a work of art, undoubtedly, yet so were the Banedos. They lived under Lorca's moon. Javi turned on the lights and asked us what we thought. I rhapsodized about the film in overheated Spanish, then Elisa and I said goodnight and walked home. Hi. Well, thank you for that, and thank you everyone for coming. It's so good to see so many unfamiliar and also familiar faces. Um, I'd like to thank you for introducing us to the Paneros and for bringing also um, this wonderful documentary, El Desencanto, which screened, which screened at a Film Forum on Saturday. And um, it was the premiere in yeah, the U.S. It, would, it had never and It's an it, extraordinary it film, so if you haven't seen it, I, I highly recommend it. Um, so why don't we start with... Um, what it was like to research this book. Because at this point, my understanding is that you were no longer living in Spain. You had moved back to the U.S. Um, many of the sources um, have passed away. Um, so what was it like to to research this and, and get in touch with many of these people? Well, so the sons had all died by the time I started writing the book. When I first saw the documentary, Leopoldo Maria, the middle son, he was still alive Um So this was, yeah, I saw this in 2012. He died in 2014. And someone had actually given me Leopoldo Maria's phone number um, if I wanted to try to connect with him because I I had gotten in touch with some people that I was interested. I had written a magazine article, but I never called him in in part because he was living in in a sane asylum in the Canary Islands. And... So I was a little intimidated about calling him, and then he had a, a persecution complex about the the CIA being after him. So I thought with my with my American accent, if I called, they'd have, I just thought it was going to be a, a very weird conversation, and maybe more about kind of my own morbid curiosity than about actually this being meaningful for him. So I never I never did it, um, and then he died, and then the following year. I started to feel, I discovered the film three years earlier. My wife and I were now living in L.A., but I just couldn't, I couldn't stop thinking about them. I'd been reading their memoirs, their their poetry. I had um, I had started contacting people they knew, and so I finally realized, okay, I want to try to turn this into a book. So we spent six weeks that summer in Spain in which I kind of touched base with some key people, an, an academic who had done some really important literary studies on the father's work, one person, the Leopoldo Maria, the middle son who lived in an insane, insane asylum, he had had a biographer in the 90s. So I started just kind of reaching out to some of, of the paneristas, which is there's a, <laughs> the, there's kind of a community of panero nerds um, in Spain. And so I tapped into them, and they were kind of very, very welcoming. And, and also people, everyone I reached out to just thought it was so weird that an American... They were just like, why do you care about this, and why would any Americans care about this? But I, you know, I was just passionate about it. So I tracked down where some some important archives with letters um, and documents. Just reached out to kind of look through a lot of end notes and books, and looking for names and reaching out. And then I I wrote a proposal, found a publisher, and and then uh, since we were living in L.A., I would spend I guess maybe about 
I would go back whenever I can't, could. Also, we always spend the holidays with my wife's family, so I'd usually go um, two weeks beforehand and do research during which was always a weird experience for my wife as she's sitting at home in LA and I'm at, and sometimes I would be at her parents' house if I was in the south of Spain and she wouldn't be there. Um, so it was, it, and then I would just have long, long days, especially in Madrid, which is where most of their community was. Um, I mean, I would just wake up, usually have a two, you know, a two hour interview. Then I would have two hours, go to the library, be looking for books and documents and go to other interviews. And I interviewed almost a hundred people total and, you know, looked over thousands of documents. Thankfully the, the, the Leopoldo Panedo archive is digitized. And so I was able to, you know, I would have had to, to probably live in Malaga where the archive is to, to really be able to go through everything. So that was very convenient. But yeah, and so it was just, uh, you know, the book is really kind of a tapestry woven out of um, interviews and the primary sources from letters and then and then other kind of historical material that, it, that I pulled together. And in addition to that, I want to pause on the historical material because, I mean, you're talking and writing about a very dark chapter in Spain's history, which is also a very contentious one to this date. Yeah. Um, and so I wanted to know how did you navigate kind of like the different interpretations and perspectives on that um, chapter and also the nuances that are attached to all of those versions? Yeah, that was I, I was definitely very nervous about that. And I remember what it's I've got gotten one big review in in Spain and I was really nervous about that. And I was happy to hear that they felt it was actually a, a, a balanced um a pretty balanced interpretation of history, but yeah, it's, it's very tricky because it is, we think of history as the historian's job is sort of to figure out the facts and objectively organize them into some sort of narrative, but it's really, you know, that's, that's kind of poignantly not the case. In Spain, there really are radically different interpretations of what the Republic was. Some people say the Republic actually didn't exist. It was a fiction um, because of the way in which it came into being and And so, I mean, there's, that's obviously a very radical interpretation. So, you know, I, I, I tried to just, you know, you have to make calls at some point and you say, you know, like, well, I do think Franco was bad. Like, okay, so I, I made, you know, I made some of those calls. Um, but I also, I tried not, uh, there's a lot of romanticization of the Republic because, you know, some really great things did happen and especially in people really romanticized Barcelona at the outbreak of the war because it was a sort of workers utopia briefly. And so I, I really wanted to make sure that I wasn't romanticizing from, since I'm on the, the left side of things personally, that I wasn't romanticizing. So I just wanted to make sure that when, when I was talking about the, the Republic and talk about the outbreak of the war in Madrid, you know, which was, there was a sort of anarchy. Those first months all, all over Spain, there was sort of, mm, there wasn't really law and order and there were people executing, you know, on, on both sides. So I just wanted to make sure that also to talk about, you know, that there was, you know, there were 7,000 clergy and, um, you know, members of the church who, you know, who were murdered and we need to talk about that and not paint it as if the, the, you know, the everything, Franco was just slaughtering people those first months just and, and the Republic was just victim. You know, there was, You know, obviously, I, I, you know, I was if I had been there, I would have been rooting for the pub, uh, the Republic. But there was some very bad things that happened. So I just tried to not rom I think I just tried to rom not romanticize. But, you know, at the end of the day, I think Franco was a tyrant and I'm against tyrants and he was repressive and I believe in freedom. So that's where I come out on things. But, uh, you know, a writer in Spain said that, you know, he felt that that I was able to to give a fairly balanced view. And I think, in, interestingly, the liter literary history in Spain is just as politici uh, politicized as political history. So a lot of Leopoldo Banedo has fallen through the cracks b because he's sort of um, damaged goods for having you know, been associated with the fascist regime. So it's some, you know, some people you know, could be upset that we're even, I'm even giving him attention and other friends f uh, of his from his group whereas you know from my point of view y you know there, there's m it's more reason to study them because of how you know especially Apollo Banero is went from being a communist poet in the 1930s to later kind of celebrated as 
uh, the you know unofficial poet laureate of the Franco regime. So you know, I think that's a, a life that has to be brought to the to the surface and studied. And it's not that I'm celebrating all the choices he made. It was just saying he we should really look at his life. Right. And in the first half of the book, we're introduced to two of the main characters, so Leopoldo and Felicidad. And, and what, what I thought was really interesting was that the structure that you choose, you, you chose was, so first we followed Leopoldo, um, how he um, went about and, and, and you know, uh, we follow his education and, and, and how he, he, he experienced a war um, directly and how he was transformed by it. And then once we're done with that, we start over in the early yeah. 20th century with Felicidad. Mm -hmm. and, um, and frankly, as a writer, I thought that was an interesting structure. And I wanted you to tell us a little, how, how did the experience of the war and, and then eventually the dictatorship, obviously, um, affected these two characters mm -hmm. and how did it change them? Yeah, and that was that was a hard from the kind of craft perspective of writing the book. That was tricky because I tried to, I tried one version where it was simultaneous, where it's you know Leopoldo's here and in this part of the war and she's there, but it, it was I just couldn't figure out how it works. So yeah, we sort of get his version of the war, and it's interesting. It's interesting. He was in Franco Franco's territory, and then and then we have his experience, and then we rewind and we get hers, and she was in Madrid you know, surviving the siege of Madrid by Franco's forces. Um, hopefully, hopefully it reads okay. It's, it, it was a, it's a strange, a straight, slightly strange structure, but I think it works. But yeah, their, their lives were really, um, they were, their lives were rewritten by the, by the war because uh, Leopoldo uh, sort of to survive. So he, he was nearly executed at the outbreak of the war, a communist poet. Um, who was in uh, nationalist territory at the time of the uprising, and the, the you know the soldiers came for him. They took him to a convent that had been converted into a prison, along with his sister's fiance. His sister's fiance was was executed, and Leopoldo was going to be executed any day. But his his mother was a distant cousin of uh, Franco's wife, and managed at the last hour to save him. After that, he to s in order to survive, he joined Franco's army. And there's actually a specific category called Category B for leftists who joined uh, Franco's army to survive. I think it was one on one hand to earmark them to say maybe keep an, keep an eye on this person, but also to also say okay, they made the decision to be to be loyal. Um, you know, they're now they're now part of us. But by the end of the war, he was writing fascist tinged poetry. So I think there was some mix of. Um, you know, ideological seduction and pragmatism. Uh, and by the end of the war, you know, he didn't root for the Nazis, uh, you know, because the World War II started right after the Spanish Civil War ended. He didn't re root for the Nazis like a lot of his friends did. So he had studied in England and felt connected to, to, to the British. Um, but, you know, he ended up climbing the ranks of the Franco regime, although I think he was also always very willfully willfully blind about what that really meant you know he's a poet you know i think the essence of poetry is free expression and then his first job was as a censor you know and then and then from he gradually became kind of an art czar who was ran a literary magazine orga organized biennials of, of art and i think he actually brought in some avant-garde stuff considering in the 1950s for what avant-garde was in spain so that that was his his arc and then his wife really his wife was a sort of timid rich kind of timid rich girl who did what you were supposed to do as a timid rich girl in the 1930s and then during the war to survive in Madrid she um, she became a nurse and she was helping the wounded and kind of had this this almost you know realization you know a woman can be way more you know that I thought I'm a, I'm a nurse it, it turned her another into another person but then Franco wins the war you have this incredibly patriarchal dictatorship that takes hold where women aren't allowed to have their own bank accounts I mean they're basically sort of children they, they have the sim very similar rights as, as children um, so she you know her life was sort of you know, she she married and she fell into very conventional, um, you know, marriage of the of the Franco era. And then she was also the muse of this poet who wrote about God and family and these kind of because not most of Leopoldo Pineda's poetry isn't um, fascist. It's just kind of very conservative Catholic poetry, and a lot of it is really beautiful. Um, 
but a very uh, there's a lot of idealization. So her and she had literary literary aspirations of her own, which just got got crushed, and just kind of her own selfhood got crushed um, under the dictatorship. So they had a difficult marriage. He was a drinker. He he you know went to, went to brothels, kind of very typical of that time. And so then when he died, and they made the 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 documentary that the this encanto, she kind of. They mm-hmm. talked a bit more sincerely about what that marriage was like, which was partly made it such an explosive documentary. And um, talking about Leopoldo's poetry in particular, so one interesting fact that um, Aaron mentions in the field is that in the book is that there are very, very few details about his experience um, in the 82nd Infantry Division. Um, and this is a poet who you know, poeticized at length about love and life and others, but he poeticized very little about war. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I wanted to kind of get yeah. your thoughts on why. Yeah, that I think. Was. Yeah, I, I, I thought that was interesting because yeah, it's almost like somehow he, like war or love, he wa- he wanted to be malleable, so he was always writing about love and trying to write about that story, and it was like war, what wasn't something he could figure out. Um, how to write about. And yeah, it was very hard to piece together. The best material I got about his war experience was uh, he, his niece, who was in her 90s. I connected with her, and she told me her memories of, like, she remembered when he was released from prison after escaping execution. She remembered just how he looked when he walked back into the house, just haggard, and she remembered him telling a story about one day they were marching as soldiers somewhere and there was no water and there was only a puddle with a dead body in it and they drank out of the puddle. Um, so that was some of the most the most vivid stuff. And then his letters are very... On the one hand, you realize that during, in a war, people are still just having very banal conversations. Like he would write to his mom, be like, I need more socks. Um, and then his, his brother died, and a lot of the letters were about putting together an anthology of his brother's poetry because his brother also wrote. But it was, there was, a, there was, a, there was a allusion to him possibly getting engaged. And then somehow, I, through this help of a historian in northern Spain, I contacted the daughter of the woman that he had a little brief courtship with while he was stationed in a town in Asturias. So she, had, she remembered her mom's memories of him. Uh, from that time that he said he was going to write her an acrostic poem that he never did <laughs> and that he drank a lot. Um, so it was really hard to really piece together that. And, you know, I'm not quite sure, I think, why he... I, th- I have a feeling it was because I don't think he really figured out a clean narrative for his own kind of political journey. He just never really figured out for himself. Whereas with his marriage, he figured out the the public narrative he wanted. You know, she was the perfect woman, and we fell in love and sort of were blessed with God in our love and I think for the war maybe he just didn't figure out a narrative that made sense because it's just very muddy when he talks about he wrote poetry openly praising the founder of Spanish fascism then writes poems later on bitching about how people call him a fascist so it's (laughs) very confusing and so we have in a way um, we follow these persons and these characters as they um in a way, experience different transformations, right? So one of them is comes as a result of the war, and the other one comes as a result of Leopoldo's passing. And this is in particular um, something that affects directly um, his sons, his three sons. Um, so tell us a little about um, the sons, mm-hmm. who are yeah. uh, really extraordinary um, people in their in their own way and extraordinary characters. Um, and you can see that in in, in the documentary certainly. Um, how did you know the, the the experiences of their parents, but also um, the passing of Leopoldo, who died quite young when he was about fifty years old, right? Um, how did that affect them? Yeah, well, so so the the sons are all I, what the, what I love about them is they're sort of archetypes, and they just represent very different approaches to the literary life and just kind of different personalities. So you have Juan Luis was sort of like. He came the closest to wanting to imitate his father. He was a bit; his poetry was a bit more con- conservative. Uh, I think he he kind of had this more traditional macho writerly swagger. It was kind of this Hemingway thing, but he was also a bit of a dandy, but more more conservative. Um, and I think he really wanted to occupy the place of his father. And then you had Leopoldo Maria, the middle brother, who was uh, I mean, he was a genius. He was reciting poetry off the top of his head when he was three years old, and it's like beautiful poetry about the apocalypse 
Um, so it's pretty, it's in, it's pretty incredible. And he, so he became, he grew up to be a, a mad, po- the kind of doom genius, mad poet. And Bol- Roberto Bolaño fictionalized him in a couple different novels. And um, and so in his poet poetry was just, you know, it's just about, it's just about like semen and and toads and just like weird stuff, just sort of. Um, kind of really just in your face transgressive just like really i'm gonna rub your face and how transgressive i'm being but a lot of it was just also gorgeous and you know it's very symbolic as well so that and he was bisexual openly bisexual did drugs i mean he was just sort of this train of chaos but was brilliant and then the 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 youngest son michi was a the kind of the handsome womanizer and he was a legendary playboy he married a movie star then got divorced he was in the tabloids he was a film critic but also had a, always had an ambivalent relationship to his like the family business of being writers and he kind of ran away from that but then always felt like a failure for never becoming a writer in his own right and i think partly because of because of insecurity so those you know those are very very d- distinct types and they they didn't get along very well, and um, so what you had is after Le- Leopoldo Panero, the the father died. It was sort of like I mean, Felicidad had a hard task of guiding guiding these sons who were all, I think they were all teenagers, um, still when he died. And they debate it in the in this encanto. There's a scene that would things have because with Leopoldo Maria, he was a political activist who ended up in jail several times. Sort of would things have ended up worked out better or worse if Dad had still been alive? Maybe he would have had a more contacts to keep the sons out of, or keep Leopoldo Maria out of prison. Maybe he would have, there would have been more conflicts in the family and possible violence between them because the father would have been so upset. It, it's it's hard to say, but his his death was what allowed them to be become legends in Spain because they made this documentary about him that he could ne- probably never would have imagined uh, getting made. Yeah, and And you would, perhaps it would be fair to, assume that in Felicidad's case, I mean, it seemed like in a way his death Mm -hmm. freed her from so many horrible things that she, he had imposed on her. Yeah. And I think partly what he specifically had uh, imposed on her and just being in, you know, in a, in a Spanish, Spanish marriage of that era. But really she says she became young, uh, young again for a while. She was going out, out to bars and with Juan Luis, the son having this, they were kind of having this weird Oedipal thing that like they considered each other newlyweds. It was b- bizarre, but yeah. And then she, she really came out of her shell and her, even her son said like, we didn't even have memories of her before our dad died. Like she was invisible. And then she was suddenly this person who's kind of charming everyone at parties. She's, she's smart. She's, you know, every, everyone I talked to people who knew her, everyone described her as seductive. And this was, these were young men who met her when she was in her, 60s and now these g- people are in their 60s they're like oh if Felicidad was so seductive and there was just something something about her and then you know the film came out she became really a legend taxi drivers would give her free ride free rides and i mean just she lived and then she published her memoirs she published short stories and her literary uh, literary aspirations that had been crushed by Leopoldo she got to live this life that she wanted to live. It was still a very hard life, and she ended up ha- having to be the caretaker of Leopoldo Maria, the the son who who had, was schizophrenic. Um, but but yeah, for she she definitely got to live a second life. And um, so before we turn to the audience, I I just wanted to ask one final question about a theme that's that's really present throughout the 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 book, and it's really this um, the fact that this family sim seemed to live their own lives as if it were some type of fiction right because like they were they were completely immersed in this literary wor- world and it was like the boundaries just like were blurred mm-hmm. um in 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 several cases and um so the second part of the book opens with a quote from Felicidad Blanc in which she says um where was my mistake perhaps in confusing literature with life books are made to be read not to live them out next to those who write them. Mm-hmm. So t- tell us a little yeah. about that and and about how um, you know this, this how they lived this world in which fiction and nonfiction kind of like just coalesced mm-hmm. in an interesting way. 
Yeah, well, so I think they took something which is universal that we all have is we all look for models and art to fashion ourselves or to, fas- you know, to create our life, create our lives. And so I think, you know, in some ways it's, it's healthy. I mean, when I was, uh, I'm kind of embarrassed about this now, but when I was 17, I got super obsessed with uh, Jack Kerouac and On the Road. And I was just a bored kid in suburbia and I didn't know what to do with myself. But now I went on road trips and it was romantic and fun and, you know, I drank and, you know, it was like, I was using art to as a model to kind of help me figure out life, which I think that's that's com- that's fairly normal as long as you can kind of grow out and, and see yourself with a little irony later on. Um, and so what the Binados did is they took that impulse that we all have but took it to a really extreme degree and kind of lived with that all their lives. For example, you know, in the Il Desencanto, there's this interesting moment where Michi's talking. He's comparing the sort of literary versus real merit of his two brothers suicide attempts and he's like well Juan Luis's were totally literary they were just absolutely he didn't really mean it and and, and it I mean it I think it's partially true he had read the the Italian writer Caesar Pavesi and his diary is very famous because the last page says something like no more words just gestures and then he killed himself so that was like for a kind of fatalistic young man that was like, all right, well, I know what I'm doing tonight. Um, and he tried to kill himself. Or he took some pills, he drank, someone found him, passed out. Um, so w- w- that's really what they did, is they took this impulse that we all have to find models or to make meaning out of things. And then, you know, you have the the tradition of the poet Maudit, which is the, the doomed poets, which Leopoldo Maria, it's not that he just invented himself, he was following in this tradition of mainly French poets who, you know, had slept with everybody, t- you know, took opium, lived insane lives and died young. He also, it was sort of like he actually imported that model into Spain and he was the first person to Im- import it and he did it at a time you know, during the Franco era and after, where that was a very you didn't a very transgressive thing. So I think, and in, 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 and you know, Felicidad has this sort of fake uh, uh, affair with she basically di- imagined this fair in, uh, an affair into an existence with a gay man who wasn't interested in her, and yet she, on her half of it, he was saying like, you know, she would hear uh, subjectively interpret the things he was saying. He would be like, you know, I'm really gonna miss you, and for her it was like you know, I'm going to miss you because our love is doomed and nothing is as strong as our love. And so she was living out this Madame Bovary fantasies that was her favorite novel. And so they were, all, yeah, they blended fact and fiction, I think, to, to find models. And part of it is this idea of it. history had just, in a way, just rewritten their lives. And so how can they do that? They, they, they rewrote it again um, as if it were a novel. So I think in a way it was you know, in, it, sort of egotistical and vain and having to do with the legacies of their family. And on the other hand, maybe a coping mechanism for, for the, the time and their, the era that they lived through. An effective one, perhaps. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so why don't we turn to the audience? If anyone has a question, I think we have a microphone over there. Madam, please. I finished reading it last night. Thank you. Thank you for reading I it. I loved it. Be- I didn't know the Paneros, mm-hmm. but it was my a lot of my history. It you're very accurate historically. Mm. Um, you brought back memories when I was first in Spain in 1964 when I was 20. I remember the television Binky Think on you stay path. I was questioned in the Puerta del Sol. <laughs> Um, but I have a question for you, mm-hmm. for your next book. Mm-hmm. Because these people, Leopoldo, he turned. Mm-hmm. And so did Felicidad. Mm-hmm. S- there were people, because I knew people, I met him a year after, I, w- I left home with a backpack, and I met him a year later in Paris when Pablo Neruda was reciting his poetry. Mm-hmm. And I ended up in Spain. And we knew, I knew people who fought for the Republic. Mm-hmm. And they still were in Spain, and they stood. Mm-hmm. Um, the woman who was the role model for me as a woman had, after the Civil War, she and her husband went to France and fought in the resistance, and then they came back. Her husband was mostly in jail and out of the country. 
uh, but you raised two boys. Mm -hmm. and I think you should write your next book <laughs> <laughs> about someone who didn't turn because they both of them did. Mm -hmm. I, I loved the book. It was I will, I will take that into consideration. <laughs>